polyneuropathies can present quite diversely, but they have in common the involvements of motor, sensory, and parts of the autonomic nervous system. And those translate into weakness. So patients may have difficulty walking. They may have difficulty using their hands and day-to-day -day function. And then in terms of the sensory realms, they may have troubles where they can't recognize what should be a normal painful stimulus. So they can hurt themselves without knowing. They can have pain that shouldn't really be present. So they're not being exposed to something noxious, but yet their hands shock, burn, and pain them. And then among some polyneuropathy patients, there are more systemic involvement. So they may actually have neuropathy as their major problem, but they also can have cognitive issues, problems with the spinal cord that lead to a more severe phenotype. But for many patients, it's quite hard to know what is the appropriate test because within the same family, the presentations might be quite diverse. Therein lies the trouble for physicians in terms of knowing what is the right test to order. So the approach is to actually think in a much more comprehensive way. When we see a patient with polyneuropathy, we first think about whether it's an inherited or an acquired process. So things that are commonly acquired are things like diabetes, but we know that diabetes really doesn't account for a large number of symptomatic neuropathies and it's common in the population. So, but if the diabetes is severe and the phenotype of a diabetic neuropathy fits, this type of testing probably would not be appropriate. But if the diabetes is mild and the severity of the neuropathy is great, one might consider that in fact the major component of this problem could be inherited. So there are certain phenotypes that suggest a much higher propensity for a positive test. So let me give you some examples of that. So the most common phenotype that we see with inherited neuropathies are an insidiously progressive onset problem of initially feet and then hands that's more weakness than sensory loss. And this is the variety that's sometimes referred to as Charcot-Marie Tooth. So those patients have a very high diagnostic yield from this type of testing. Then we have um, other phenotypes that may present predominantly as pain, but they can also have weaknesses in addition. And they also have a fairly high diagnostic yield. Patients who present with only weakness are most commonly inherited, but the diagnostic yield in genetic testing is fairly low only because we don't know many of the genes that are responsible for that. So that's a characteristic phenotype that may have a lower yield but could still be considered by this approach. Now age is important. So if persons present at less than age 50 with a polyneuropathy and no obvious cause, so no obvious diabetes, uh, no um, associated systemic inflammatory disease, no clear acquired etiology, these patients have a very high diagnostic yield from this type of testing. So the patients that we should not consider for this testing tend to be older. They tend to have only sensory symptoms without any motor findings. And they may actually have those sensory symptoms not from a neurologic cause, but from a rheumatologic cause. And this group of patients has sometimes been referred to as chronic idiopathic axonal polyneuropathy. And although these persons may have their disorder run in the family, it tends to be polygenic. When clinicians decide among the six offered evaluations for peripheral neuropathy, which is best, in general, our experience is that misclassification clinically often leads to a failed diagnostic attempt. So for the majority of our patients, we think the comprehensive evaluation or expanded panel is the best way. Now there are exceptions. Some phenotypes are very true and run true within an individual family. And so for them, we think that ordering a specific targeted approach, for instance, among the sensory predominant neuropathies or among patients who have a spastic paraparesis and neuropathy are still appropriate. So for most of our patients, unless a very discrete phenotype has been established to link with a gene abnormality, we think the expanded panel of neuropathy inherited cause is the best yield. Minimal testing is important. So all patients should undergo some type for blood sugar. So either a hemoglobin A1C or a fasting challenge to look for diabetes because it's common 
And it's also important, even if it is inherited, as a potential contributor to make things worse. And it's quite treatable. The same way, B12 deficiency can present and look like inherited neuropathies and may make an inherited neuropathy worse. So that type of limiting testing can be ordered. And if unremarkable, one could then reflex to the uh, polyneuropathy inherited valuation. If you're a young onset person with family history, the diagnostic yield can be as high as 33%. And so what was quite interesting though, there is usually a 10 year lag between when patients first had symptoms and when they had a final diagnosis made by our comprehensive approach. And so in the process, they had seen many different physicians, accrued new deficits, didn't have proper counseling as to how to handle this problem or what were the risks for their family members. So the nice thing about the test is for many of our findings, there's a definitive cause found and they can stop shopping for what is the cause of their problem. And um, for some of these, depending on the category, there are evolving therapies that are both on a research level but also coming at a commercial level as well. If the technology of next generation sequencing is going to revolutionize how we see our patients in the clinics. So specifically, we know that among certain phenotypes, the value of this testing is very high. And so historically, what might have occurred would be that multiple electrophysiologic evaluations would be performed. A large list of blood tests would be accumulated in this patient's record, and they might see multiple specialists. But the power of this testing is that persons with out expert knowledge gain the strength of a laboratory test that can help direct future evaluations. So for instance, a person who presents with a strong family history of an inherited neuropathy or presents before the age of 40 without an obvious cause, one might start with this testing, look for the discovery, and then based on it, decide about additional testing. Where in the past, the genetic testing was considered esoteric and might be the last thing one would order. So again, this is largely based on our certainty of the age of onset, the clinical phenotype, and knowledge of family history. Important in this type of evaluation is an integrated approach with multiple experts. So we need good laboratory scientists that can help us to make a test that meets the guidelines for a a commercially available offering. But coupled with that is the importance of having people who are knowledgeable about these disorders, knowing what potential services may be available to patients with these disorders. And so that's a link to our laboratory geneticists, but also clinicians uh, who are seeing these patients that can provide further counsel and maybe even referral if the local um, physician is unclear about how to counsel persons with these disorders.